Next, we have Inga from the Farm Table. Um, for those of you who don't know, that's a, it's a show that she hosts um, about cooking, and she's going to be sharing with us a little bit about cooking with maple syrup. Inga is a fourth generation dairy farmer, milking cows and making cheese on her small farm in Wisconsin. Inga's passion for farming and local food led her to co-create and host the PBS television series Around the Farm Table. Part cooking show, part farming adventure, the series highlights Midwest farmers and food producers. Inga also hosts a podcast by the same name, and she's going to show us some things that we can cook with maple syrup today. Take it away, Inga. Can you guys hear me okay? And see me okay? Hello? Well, welcome to the farm. Uh, like you said, my name is Inga Witcher and I'm a proud Wisconsin dairy farmer. I grew up on a small farm out in Washington state. My parents milked about 80 cows on their 150, 200 acre dairy farm out there. Back in the 90s, quite a few families from Washington State actually uprooted their farms and moved to the Midwest, specifically northern Wisconsin. And it was after that that we soon followed suit. And now I've been in Wisconsin for 15 years. I can't imagine living anywhere else. And it was because of our move to the Midwest that we were so inspired, uh, my father and I, to start a series around the farm table. When I first moved here, I really thought Wisconsin was just milk cows, maybe some corn, some soybeans, alfalfa. I thought that's what was being grown here. But I soon found out that the agriculture here in Wisconsin is so diverse. We're the number one producers of cranberries in the world. We are the number one producers of ginseng, uh, goat's milk, uh, so many other things, maple syrup. Uh, all these different oils, like pumpkin seed oil and sunflower oil. And so it was after discovering these different things that we realized, and we, we really, we had the concept to do a television series while my dad and I were milking cows on our small farm in Osseo, that we wanted to be able to tell the stories of all of these different producers in the Midwest. And so we decided the best way to do that is to start a television series. We're now in our eighth season. We have new shows coming out in 2021. We had to kind of take a little break from filming because of COVID, but also because over the last year, I've transitioned from selling my milk from the cows to a co-op into making a farmstead cheese right here on my small farm. I have eight cows now. I downsized from about 50 cows down to eight beautiful Jersey cows. And then we use that milk from those eight cows to make a cloth bound cheddar style cheese. And that cheese is a raw milk, which means it has to be aged for at least 60 days. But we like to age it for a minimum of six months before we start uh, to release it to the public. It's been such an amazing journey to be able, and I'm sure most of you can feel the same way about collecting that sap and making it into amazing product. And I kind of feel the same way about collecting this beautiful milk and making it into a cheese. And I think that's oh, one, one thing we all have in common is we love to celebrate uh, Wisconsin and what we have here. One of my favorite ways to celebrate is with a cocktail. But before you have a cocktail, you like to have a little something to munch on before you're drinking, right? Just so you can kind of even it out. <laughs> So one thing that I really love to have is a handful of nuts. And so today I'm gonna to teach you how to make some maple syrup herbal spiced nuts. So the first thing I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna mix some olive oil. Really pretty. Some maple syrup, one tablespoon plus a little extra. And the maple syrup I'm using today is called Skinny Sticks and it is from Marathon, Wisconsin. So if you're watching, we're really excited to be able to use your maple syrup. I was at the grocery store, my little small grocery store in Osseo the other day, picking out some maple syrup and the woman that was checking me out was so excited. She's like, have you had this maple syrup before? And I said, no, no, I haven't. And she said, 
Oh, it's life changing. It's so, so good. And they also have a bourbon flavored maple syrup too. And she was just like, we, we can never go back to, you know, the, the, the corn syrup, maple, you know, maple syrups that, uh, that a lot of people are getting at the grocery store. She says, we have to have pure maple syrup from now on. It's life changing. And I think the special thing is, is when people are tasting these products, like pure maple syrup, it's like biting into a tomato in August, right from the garden, where it's just bursting with flavor. And it's so wonderful. And you could never go back to buying a a grocery store tomato in December, right? It's just completely day and night difference. So I've got my olive oil in here. I've got my maple syrup, and then I'm going to use some herbs. My favorite herbs to use, rosemary is one of my all-time favorite herbs. It smells so divine. I even sometimes will throw it in my bathtub just to like have the aromatics in the room makes me feel like I'm at a spa. And they also say, well, there's a few little lures that go along with rosemary. One thing is they say, if you're growing rosemary in your house, if it grows really well, then that means the woman is in charge of the house. If it doesn't grow well, that means the man's in charge of the house. My rosemary grows amazing. So I'm just gonna take my rosemary off the stem and you can break it up a little bit in your fingers while you do it. That again, just kind of releases some of those oils. And then I take a sharp knife here and just chop this as much as I can. And hopefully my table is not gonna completely fall down as I go. Herbs are one of those things that I always like to use fresh. It really makes a difference, I think, especially for a recipe like these nuts where it's kind of one of the star ingredients. There's only a few ingredients in here, so everything's really the star. All right, get up nice. <laughs> the aromatics in the house right now so, smell so good. I should start taking this out to the barn with me, maybe get that smelling better. So I've got some rosemary and then some thyme. And I'm just gonna take the thyme off of the thyme stalks here, the stems. This is a tedious job. If you got some little kids handy, this is a great job for them. One thing I love is getting kids involved in cooking because I think when they know how to cook, well, it's just, they, they can eat so much more. I know I have four nephews and when they're down with me, I haven't seen them in quite a while because of COVID, but when they come down the summertime, sometimes we'll harvest things out of the garden and then we'll go inside and we'll cook them. And they're eating vegetables, they're eating everything and they're participating in the growing of the food, the harvesting of the food and the cooking of the food. And it's just such a good experience. That's how I learned to cook is by gardening with my grandparents, my parents, my mom cooking in the, you know, in the kitchen, she'd always have us give her a hand doing something. And it's just, it's a great way to learn. It's a great way to teach kids about food, nutrition, and most importantly, where food comes from. So many people nowadays, don't realize who's growing their food, where it's coming from. 7% of adults in the United States think that chocolate milk comes from brown Swiss or brown cows, which is just ridiculous. <laughs> and I think, it, you know, the, the more you can connect with where your food comes from, the better it tastes too. And if you can have that conversation around your table of what's happening, that's always a nice thing. I actually had a group of folks come out from Minneapolis a few years ago to see the farm and to see the cows. And I have those Jersey cows. So they have those big eyelashes and they sort of look like deer. They're really beautiful. And one of the folks asked me, well, what's the hardest part about milking cows? And jokingly, I said, well, I have to get up early in the morning and do like a little bit of mascara on the cows and give them that beautiful smoky eye look. And she said, that sounds like a lot of work. I thought, yeah. Yeah, okay. So that's why it's important to know where the food's coming from. All right, so I've got my rosemary in there. I'm gonna put my thyme in there. And then the recipe that I'm using calls for a quarter of a teaspoon of cayenne pepper. You can also use ancho pepper if you like a little bit more spice. I really like spicy things. So I'm gonna add a little bit more cayenne. 
And then I'm gonna to toss in my nuts. Today I'm using some walnuts. Uh, you can also use pecans with this too. Whatever you, uh, really only walnuts or pecans. I don't think a lot of different nuts would work with this. Almonds, whole almonds would be nice. So pop that in there. And then I'm gonna use my tablespoon here to stir it around with. I'd use my hands, but I don't know where they're going. No, I'm very clean. It's nice to have a reason to come in from the barn and put on a little makeup, uh, comb my hair, get, get ready for the day. This is so nice. COVID has just been one of those crazy times for all of us. I'm really thankful that I can work from home, that I milk cows. I have a reason to get out of bed every day and, and keep working. And that I'm in a little pod with my family and my husband and my parents. So we get to work together quite a bit on my farm. And it's really, you know, I, t I tell my parents all the time, I'm so grateful for their, their help on the farm, whether it's getting, helping get the cows in, making cheese, delivering cheese, any of these things. It's really a group effort. And I'm sure a lot of you know that it takes the whole family to make some of these things work. So now I've got my oven preheated to 350. I'm gonna go ahead and put all of these nuts down on my parchment paper lined baking sheet. And then we're gonna pop those in the oven for about 12 minutes. You can turn them, go in with your spatula and turn them once. Once they come out of the oven, sprinkle some beautiful sea salt on top and then let them cool back down to room temperature. So next, we're gonna continue on with our cocktails with uh, a maple syrup old fashioned. It's Saturday morning, so it's not too early to start having cocktails, I think. And we're gonna start with a little bit of, oh, by the way, these are what the nuts look like when they come out. These are the pecans that we did yesterday. And it's really, this recipe is great using maple syrup because the nuts won't burn. You know, sometimes during the holidays, we do these sort of uh, spiced nuts and things like that. And when you're using sugar with this recipe, it has a tendency to really burn those nuts where with the maple syrup, that doesn't happen. So the first thing I did to prepare for my cocktails is I made these amazing ice cubes. And you, you can find these ice cube trays now with these giant, that you can make these giant ice cubes in. And these are so wonderful because they don't melt as fast as like a small cube, right? So they're not gonna muddle up your drink at all. <laughs> and that's one thing I think we can all agree on. We don't wanna water down cocktail. So for this recipe, I'm gonna add my maple syrup first. This maple syrup is from Ellsworth, um, Betcher's maple syrup. Okay, I'm gonna put well, I'm just, I'm not going to measure. I don't think you should measure when you do cocktails. Let's see. That's about an ounce and a half of maple syrup. You can make these right into the glass, but I found this at a thrift store and I love using it. So I'm going to make it right inside there. And then I'm going to do four ounces or so of whiskey or bourbon. Here in Wisconsin, we have a local bourbon. It's called J. Henry. It's down, the, the family's in Dane, Wisconsin, and they started doing these amazing bourbons a few years ago. They're a multi-generational family farm, and they were selling seed corn and uh, selling corn to the markets, and then they realized that they wanted to do something value-added. So on a, when they were on a trip to Kentucky, they realized that they're sitting on all this beautiful corn. So they decided to turn that corn into an amazing bourbon. And it's just the flavor is so amazing. And also it's great that we have products like that right in our state. Again, when, we're, when you're supporting local, it is so amazing because you're putting that money right back into that farmer's hands. And then they're in turn spending that money right in their community. So that's another one of the benefits. We're using whiskey today because we're Irish and Scandinavian. So I'm gonna do a couple of these and then a little bit more because COVID, right? Already. I'm gonna do a couple dashes of bitters. 
not too many. And then go ahead and stir that up. We're gonna be dissolving that maple syrup. This is another place where it would be really fun to use one of those bourbon maple syrups to give it that extra flavor. So now that that's stirred up and the maple syrup is dissolved, I'm just gonna take some of my orange peel here and put it right around the outside of my glass and then set that inside. I'll do it again with this other one because I might want two cocktails. I'm just kidding. I'm not gonna drink two of them. Put that right in the glass. And then I'm gonna pour this right over for a little happy hour. On Friday nights, my husband and I do cocktails with the cows. So in the during the evening milking, we'll take a little cocktail out with us and do our little chairs. You know, being a dairy farmer, you can't really get away that much, especially during COVID, we're not going anywhere. So it's nice to have these little reasons to celebrate like cocktails with the cows Friday nights. <laughs> so let me taste it and make sure it's good. Oh my gosh, that's really, really good. The maple syrup really comes through and it makes it nice and smooth, not too sweet and really, delicious. So the next recipe that I want to teach you guys today is one of my favorites. Uh, and it's a grilled cheese. And actually, I'm not going to be showing you how to do this. Because I don't know when you're thinking back on your childhood. I know for me, grilled cheese was one of the first things that my mom would always make for us at lunchtime or dinner time. And so I think the most important ingredient when you're making a grilled cheese is actually your mother. Oh, there you go. Thank you. <laughs> so I wanna introduce you guys to my mother, Cynthia. She's been on this journey with us for this whole time. So with a lot, of, do a cheers. Tell cheers. me what you think. It's good, right? It's, it's great. <laughs> I've been practicing with the maple syrup recipes and <laughs> I'm telling everybody it's a you're it's I'm a it's, believer. I know, me too, me too. It's like I like I almost want to start making simple syrups too with the maple syrup. Like maybe like a maple, so like maybe doing equal parts maple syrup with a little bit of water, heat it up, and then maybe put like a cinnamon stick in there. Oh, and so instead can, of using sugar. Right, instead of using sugar, and then you can infuse that maple syrup with a cinnamon, and then you can even put that into a fun cocktail with a whiskey or a bourbon as a different, you know, just a fun That's way a to idea. use something. Well, just the FYI, the nuts, you guys probably know if you're using your maple syrup for everything, these nuts do not burn in the oven when you use maple syrup. When you use sugar, they burn and they, they stick. And they stick and they yeah. burn. I pass them around to my neighborhood and everybody really enjoyed uh, that part of it. So one thing, when a lot of people think that we have this giant production with our television series that we have uh, like, you know, 20 people behind the scenes and really it's my mom and my dad and myself. And so my mom does a lot of our recipe testing. Uh, she packs our lunches when we're, we're off on the road and, and going out to uh, visit different farms. She does the dishes, uh, she cooks for the crew. Uh, she keeps me and my dad hydrated with uh, making sure that we're having our water or a little cup of coffee as a pick-me-up. And so really around the farm table, just like our farm, it's a family event. And so I'm really grateful that my mom's here with me today to make these grilled cheese sandwiches. Because like I said, the number one, the most important ingredient when you're making your grilled cheese sandwiches is your mother. So tell us how you do this. All right. Well... First of all, because we are going to make a salty, sweet, uh, adult version of grilled cheese. Grilled cheese. A grown-up grilled cheese, we'll call it. Yeah, a grown-up grilled cheese. This is something you can use outside. I mean, we're all meeting our friends outside, right? Around the campfire. Oh, these will knock their socks off. Also great for maple syrup season when you guys are out in the woods. Take a little cast iron skillet out there and you can make some grown-up grilled cheese. Right. So today, for the sweet 
we're going to use um, a fourth of a cup. This will be for four sandwiches. A fourth of a cup of pure maple syrup. Thank you. Inga will do all the, the talking. The, Okay, and I mixed up a little thing of apple spice. Apple pie spice. Apple pie spice. So what did you put in your apple pie spice? Two teaspoons of cinnamon, a full teaspoon of nutmeg, fresh grated, and a half a teaspoon of cardamom. Oh, what is cardamom? That's kind of like a sweet, spicy, That's not a, spicy. Well, it's more of a Norwegian thing. A That's Scandinavian. right, a Scandinavian thing, right. Scandinavian, for the, you know, my grandmother used it constantly in her cookies. Uh, the grandmother, back then, grandmothers only made cookies. You only got to go over for cookies. So, we're going to mix that together. Have it in a cute little pourable container. This is what, when we have uh, pancakes for breakfast or French toast, we always serve our maple syrup in these fun little, um, what do you, little pitchers, right? Yeah. Because the syrup will come out the, the mouth of the... <laughs> Um, it's kind of gross. It's like she's throwing up, but it's uh, my nephews love it. Like it's the most fun they've ever had eating is like when they can just like put the make the chicken puke all over their pancakes, right? <laughs> oh, okay. We used that one that was a cow. You guys have all seen those cow ones that sit there with the four legs, and I served it at a dairy fam a dairy uh, farmers um, convention or con get, to get together, and the men picked up because. It was cream. They picked it up and they weren't sure which end was going to come out of. Was that funny? Oh All right, now you talk to him about this cheese and how you guys, this is the greatest cheese ever. She has to say that because she's my mom. <laughs> now, so this is our St. Isidore's cheddar. Uh, and it's available right now online at Fromogenation. Uh, you can also find a link on our Facebook page around the farm table. So, and you'll notice how it is this beautiful yellow color. And that's because our cows are rotationally grazed. So what that means is we take them from, my dad's signaling to my mom to stop drinking her cocktail. <laughs> You're fine, mom. <laughs> my, uh, so what we do every morning is we, during the grazing season, is we put the cows out onto fresh pasture. And then in the evening after milking, we change them to a different pasture. pasture. And that's called intensive grazing or rotational grazing. And why that's so beneficial is because the cows are out harvesting their own food. They're out spreading their own manure. They're putting their hooves into the ground, aerating that soil. But really our farm is about building soil. So for us to be able to have the cows go out there and spread their manure and work with the ecology of our land is really important to us. One of the many benefits of grazing cows is that we have habitat for all kinds of different species. So there's certain birds that can only lay, that can only nest uh, in grasslands. So, so they need rugged pasture to be able to, to uh, nest in. And we allow that to happen at our farm. What happens also is some of those birds, uh, they need certain insects to eat, right? And so by allowing all these native grasses to grow, native plants, different wildflowers that have been introduced over the years, that's what's all happening around our farm that now we're pulling in all these different insects uh, so that the birds can feed on the insects and the, the bunnies can eat and the, rab or the uh, foxes and the possums and all these different things. So by farming, we, we not only wanna take care of our cows, we really wanna take care of our land. And that's what's really important to us. And that's my long-winded way of saying, that's why the cheese is this color, is because the cows are out eating grass. Uh, and the grass makes the milk a really beautiful uh, yellow, like yeah, a, a, yes, butter, a butter, a butter yellow. yellow. Um, and so this is, this is the cheese that we make from our eight cows. And it's a, what, like I said, we're aging it. So the flavor develops really during the aging process. And there's a few different ways to taste cheeses, uh, depending on that style of cheese. For an aged cheese like this, for an Alpine style cheese, you can cut it into um, a little rectangle like this. Triangle. Uh, triangle, sorry. Triangle. <laughs> triangle. I was homeschooled, sorry. Um, and you want to start eating from the middle uh, to the outside. 
because the outside, that's the rind of our cheese. So what, what I said, when I say we bandage it, we wrap it in cheesecloth twice, and that helps develop this amazing rind that will in turn develop the texture. The inside of the cheese is gonna taste slightly different than the outside, and that is really buttery today. Our butter fat content right now with our cows is about six, uh, 6%. Which is extremely high butter fat. And that's what makes our cheese so extremely buttery. Right. Oh, there was ice. What? We, did you want some more? Well, no, if I need to say anything, I have to jump in right away because it goes as quickly as it goes. Oh. <laughs> it's a cocktail. Right. Smell some rosemary. It helps you remember things. That's one of the many benefits. Oh, it helps your memory. <laughs> so I'm just going to cut up this cheese here. When you're eating cheese like our St. Isidore's, mm -hmm. You want to bring it to room temperature. That's what I was going to say. Yeah, because cheeses, they really come up, they're alive. They're always changing, this kind of a cheese. And when you serve it at room temperature, all this, I have like butter in my mouth now. <laughs> it's amazing. All those flavors can really come through when it's at room temperature. It's a completely different thing at when it's in the fridge. Well, and so she's, we started sending out to relatives and to friends. Our friends call this and they, they were so excited. They said, Cynthia, you told us to have room temperature. Well, we thought it was room temperature, but the doorbell rang. We had to go out and talk to our neighbors for a half an hour outside. And we came back and the cheese had another flavor exploding in our mouth from the first time they thought it was room temperature to the next time. This, the flavor of live cheese just explodes just like the flavor of pure maple, maple syrup. syrup. I just want to say one more thing. Uh, I got a chance to go to France a few years ago and it was amazing. I love just to drop it. Oh, we've been to France, right? <laughs> <laughs> I <laughs> <And> haven't. <laughs> uh, but I got to do a cheese tasting in France and I was thinking, I was tasting this goat cheese. It was a fresh goat cheese and it tasted like herbs de Provence. So it tasted like lavender, rosemary, thyme. And I was thinking to myself, this is, I mean, come on, these people are adding herbs into their cheese, like when it's supposed to be this beautiful raw milk cheese. And I couldn't see any herbs in the cheese itself, but I was like, oh, that's really tacky, very cheesy. And I <laughs> asked the woman who was doing the cheese tasting, I said, well, why would they do that? And she said, oh, no, 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 it's a raw milk cheese that you're tasting what the goats were eating two days ago, that it's, it's coming through in the milk. And so with, with our raw milk cheese here too, it's, you want, it, it tastes of the pastures of our farm, the tour of our farm. And I, you know, it's just okay. exciting. So back to your grilled cheese. All right. So we have our sweet ready to go. I have my bacon crisp ready to go. And has anybody ever read Ruth Reichel? She, she was the editor for Gourmet Magazine and um, New York Times food critic. food critic. She's got many books out. Uh, she's quite a remarkable cook. So she was, I was listening to one of her books and it was use mayonnaise instead of butter and your food will not burn. So I am using mayonnaise. Chance, my husband I, would love this recipe. He puts mayonnaise on everything. I mean, everything. It's disgusting. Oh, we need to cut apple. Oh. And, uh, okay, so when you do an apple, oh, take a look at this homemade bread just for you guys this is the you know aren't we all making bread this time is uh, COVID. COVID. <laughs> uh, so this is the no need bread i have a uh bread pan no smell so. the rosemary so you remember <laughs> <laughs> a crush that i baked this in to make it look like a loaf what just tell them really quick what's oh. in the bread recipe because it's so easy it is so delicious all right, this is the noni bread, three cups of flour, a fourth of a teaspoon of yeast, one teaspoon of salt, and one and a half cups of, you know, very warm water out of the tap, not out of the kettle. Stir it up until it's just shaggy. When we first started making this bread, I will be honest, I like to do things very hard. And so I would just knead it like crazy with my spoon. That was my childhood. <laughs> and so my husband had to take over making the bread because he just does this. 
And darn if it doesn't turn out every time. So it's a very shaggy bread. It sits overnight on your counter. And then the next morning you get up, you flip it out, let it rest for 15 minutes, then shape it up with a little more flour. And then you fit it into whatever bowl. To let it rise again. To let it rise. Right. It rises for two hours and then you put it into a hot like, oven. Like what do you use? A uh, Dutch oven. Dutch oven. She uses a Dutch oven. So that's a round. I put it into a small bowl. And then the Dutch oven goes into the oven half an hour before you need it. So that way the Dutch oven can get to room or to, to that 450 degrees, that hot temperature. And then the bread starts cooking as soon as it goes then in. You pop it in, put the lid on back in half an hour, take the lid off 15 more minutes and it's done. Sorry, that wasn't going to be part of the cooking demonstration. What but you I, guys asked? But, <laughs> well, I had, a, I had a piece of toast this morning with this bread and it was just like, I forget how, I can't make it as good as my parents do. Like, uh, I don't know why I'm the one on TV. My mom was the cook here, uh, but it, I was tasting it. And I just thought, oh, that's right. It's like three ingredients and it's so good. All right, All right, back to your grilled cheese. All right, so we're gonna start with our cheese. Can you remind me, what do we have in here? We're gonna have, this is our sweet with maple syrup and the apple is gonna be our- Apple pie. Oh, apple pie flavoring. spice. And you can just buy apple pie spice too. No, you don't want to do that. <laughs> no. Just don't, just put it like in a different container so people think you made it from scratch. Right. So I'm going to, uh, I, you know, we all like a little cheese, correct? Oh, you got to clean your apples. I got my apples. Okay, now the apples. You know, love putting apples in your sandwiches is fantastic. Well, also apples and cheddar go really well together. But I found, you know, I've tried many kinds, but the golden delicious, the softer apple is the best because you really don't want to bite into a soft hunk of cheese and a hard apple. I, it's just, it doesn't work. Do you well. know, okay, so I was doing some research. So cheddar originally comes from the Somerset region in England where dairy is really, uh, oh, uh, you know, very much part of the region. They do a lot of grazing with their cows there. And they also grow a lot of apples in that area. And there's a thing that's, what is it called? Uh, what goes together grows together. So oh. if you look at these different regions, like that's why like if you pair a cheese with a certain wine in the same region, well, they're growing in the same regions, they go together. Or like for companion things with tomatoes and basil. If you plant tomatoes and basil together in your garden, they help each other grow. Uh, they deter different pests from each other, uh, but they taste really well together, right? So what goes together grows together. All right. So let us know what grows with maple trees. Ramps, right? Oh, ramps. Yeah. Summertime. Oh, spring. Spring, right. Spring. How many of you use the ramps? Inca started using them several years ago, and she got overzealous with the first batch. I think the neighbors could even smell her breath <laughs> from like three miles away. It was pretty harsh. So I have my crisp bacon already done, already on here. And this is another product. When you're sourcing your ingredients, we have a million, or not a million, sorry. We have, a, that's the cocktail talking now. Uh, we have a lot of different producers of pork here in Wisconsin that are growing uh, these kind of forgotten breeds or these heritage breeds of pigs. And what that means is the taste is completely different than sort of these industrial hogs that you get when you're buying grocery store bacon, right? And you'll notice it cooks so different. Uh, we, we always exactly. source like, our bacon from local producers. Uh, my husband the other day brought home bacon from the grocery store and I tried to cook it. I ended up throwing it away. It was so gross. It was, a, it was so much grease. Different. It was so, yeah, sorry. It was very different. different. And I really prefer those uh, heritage breed hogs, not only because I do my best to support local, but also the flavor is just amazing. And being on a farm, we always buy our hogs by the quarter. We always butcher our own steers. So it's nice when you can kind of have that in the freezer, and then your husband doesn't have to go to the store and buy the wrong thing. It's, all right, all right, so we've got that down. I'm going to put it on. Oh, this probably needs to be hotter. And we use cast iron for a lot of our cooking. There it we just go. it just cooks it so much more evenly. And using this is probably going to be you know better than the mayonnaise is on. 
now we'll get it going. You know, this is supposed to be a cooking show, right? But I have an idea. Uh, Here we go. It's the cocktails again. The meat. I went to our local um, meat store that they advertise. It's also sometimes called a butcher shop. Butcher shop. And they advertise fresh meat. So I asked them, just where do you get your meat? Guess where they got their fresh meat that they could butcher? Sam's Club. Kansas City. No kidding. So always ask where you're getting your right. meat from. If it's coming from local, fantastic, and push it. You guys push that it comes from Wisconsin. Right, right. And also, you know, uh, with the sourcing of different things, uh, like I said before, I mean, there's so many benefits to buying local. Just one of them being you're going to get these really fantastic ingredients that just taste so much better. Uh, the difference of having pure maple syrup than, uh, you know, what are the... And the honey. Mrs. Butterworths or something. You know, it's completely different. Honey, if you buy honey in the jars in the grocery store, if you don't know where it's coming from, it can be up to 90% corn syrup. So you're basically basically buying corn syrup, which is, you know, not great for us. I'd rather have pure honey. Uh, and honey that's served with it, that is produced within 50 miles of your home, gives you the antigens and the antibodies you need to help with the pollen. We actually can't legally say, I, I, I said that on one of our yeah. first episodes of the show, because that's what I've heard. I've heard like you use it, like if you're eating your honey locally, you're, you're, those bees are going up, getting that pollen that you might be allergic to. But then if you're, you're kind of, um, you know, building up your antibodies by having that honey. And some of the folks at PBS said, well, you can't say that you're not a doctor. I was like, I don't think anyone thinks I'm a doctor. That's for sure. <laughs> but we also use it. Uh, I've actually used it. And I had a cow, she got her foot stuck on some barbed wire and ripped part of her uh, shin up. And so uh, honey is also natural antibiotic. So I kept putting honey on her, uh, on her open wound and it actually healed it. And I was telling my mom about this, like a year later, I said, oh gosh, this honey thing. And she goes, oh, that doesn't always work. When you were a little kid, you had a cut. And I put a that burn, on. bad burn. Oh, on this burn? Bad burn. And she kept putting honey on it. And what did I go, like septic or something with an infection? <laughs> Pretty soon there was red streaks going up her arm. I knew we were in trouble. <laughs> By the way, she's a nurse too. So, <laughs> right. so don't get up trying on your kids. But if you have a cow with an open wound, I think it's fine for that. Right. I sure back then I probably didn't know I should have had local honey. <laughs> it was probably Maybe. corn syrup. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the other benefits when I, I was thinking today about our small farm and how uh, every week I go. Uh, about a mile down the road to a neighboring farmer. He grows uh, corn, beans, uh, he does bedding, and he also does hay, for, and he provides us our hay. So every week we spend $240 directly a mile down the road uh, to, to purchase our hay for that week for our cows. So our cows are eating local, we're eating local, uh, but what, what, that, what I mean to say is that we're putting that money every week back into our local economy. In turn, I know that he goes to our local uh, shops, or, you know, our local, um, what is a parts store to buy his parts. So he's putting that money right back into our downtown, uh, feeding his family, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So when you support farmers like us or, or maple syrup producers, you know, we're always putting that money back into our rural communities and we're losing a lot of those communities. Uh, so I think it's more important than ever to be shopping local and supporting local. Couple ways you can do that: uh, grow your own, uh, harvest your own maple syrup, have a garden. Uh, another way is shop at your farmers markets, shop at your local co-ops. But there, in Wisconsin, we have this amazing magazine called the Farm Fresh Atlas. I'm sure a lot of you are, uh, you, you know, familiar with that Farm Fresh Atlas, and it's for different regions of Wisconsin. So you can find yours uh, online. Uh, also, I see them at libraries or local food stores. And then you can go through and it'll give you a list of where you can find your pork, where you can find your lamb, where you can find your CSA, Community Supported Agriculture. So it's all right there for you. Uh, or you can watch it on the farm table too and see some of that. Right. <laughs> and just one thing I was gonna mention too, when we first moved here, we actually, I don't think we ate real maple syrup. 
Well, I don't think it was until we moved People here. did that in Washington State, did they? No, I don't. Well, some did. Like, yeah. So our first year, we loved it. I sent it out to all the relatives, you know, because it comes in a smaller plastic that can travel easily through the mail. I forgot to tell anybody to, it has to be refrigerated. My two relatives didn't read, you know, they just didn't read it. And oh, I just saw it refrigerate after. Opening. Yeah, it always says. I don't think I knew that. <laughs> yeah, nobody knows that. I mean, those of us that aren't used to real maple syrup, we don't know it. So now I've always, when I send these out, I always say refrigerate after opening. And my, I have one cousin in Seattle, and she's really cute. She goes, "You are making me spend so much more for my food. I have to buy the syrup now." And then she had to go buy real Parmesan cheese. She was really mad about that <laughs> when she found out there's real cheese. And so we've sent everybody, you know, real cheddar. It's just to enlighten and they will then enlighten their friends. We just keep giving and it will just keep enlightening people. Right. Well, and I, I mean, like, I, you know, I love, uh, I love the story behind food too. I think that's something that's really important. <laughs> for me when I'm eating food too, is just to, to know the story behind food. I've gotten the chance to go a few times to see some maple syrup. I was able to go up to Luck, Wisconsin to Morley's Maple Syrup a few years ago and get a, Dad, you're moving the camera, <laughs> and get a behind the scenes look at how maple syrup is produced. And it was totally enlightening to me. I had no idea the amount of work that goes into making maple syrup, you know, this much maple syrup. It's just amazing. Uh, I've also been down to Beanie Trees in Viroqua, in, uh, near Viroqua area, and to see that they're going 24 hours a day during that season is just mind-blowing. Uh, how, you know, as a dairy farmer, people always say, oh, dairy farmers are the hardest working farmers. I used to think that too until I started spending time with all these other farmers, and I thought, geez, our job's pretty easy compared to having to do all this extra work to clean the lines, to repair things, to boil things down. Uh, or with these vegetable farmers doing these CSAs and community supported agriculture, they're growing 75 different crops and they're having to harvest those by hand and wash everything and market your product too. That's one thing that's like, uh, another reason why we started the show is marketing your product is so hard. So how do we tell this? How do we get people to buy our products as farmers, as maple syrup producers? We need to educate people about the story behind the products. One thing that I started doing years and years ago is contacting libraries around the state of Wisconsin and asking if I could come give talks. And by giving talks, by talking to these people, by connecting them with growers in their community, I feel like more and more people can understand what all of us understand is when you're, you know, have these great products, things turn out so differently, right? So I would encourage all of you too to contact the library locally. Uh, maybe not, you know, maybe this year is not the best year to to have people to your farm or or whatever because of COVID, but to educate people in your community, whether that's through social media, getting posts out on Facebook showing people how your maple syrup is produced is so important to getting people to, to realize why it's so special. I'm gonna cut open our sandwich here. And, okay, can I ask a question? Yes. Can I ask a question to the audience? You guys are used to working outside in the cold. That looks really good. And how do you keep, so you've got a crowd over. You always have a crowd probably, people like to see. How do you feed them? You know, how do you keep anything warm? I call my mom. <laughs> no, well, we go over, you know, we've been around the uh, campfire, around the campfire, around the neighborhood. We all get together socially, totally socially distanced. And I would make, make things in the house and run it over just across the street. And by the time I got over there, hey, it's cold, but it tastes okay. But is there any way? Crock pot. You got to just make pot? something in a crock pot. Oh, I like the syrup cheese. But, um, so any ideas? You can put it on around the farm table and give me a hint on how to keep things warm. Uh, we found the ice cubes. Did you talk to me oh, about those big I ice did, cubes? I did, yeah. So again, like, look, at we made our cocktails a, a while ago, and the ice cubes still haven't melted. And that's why we're using big ice cubes. If you don't want to go ahead and buy an ice cube tray, these large ice cube trays, 
you can actually get water balloons, small water balloons, fill them up with water and then tie them off and put them in the freezer and freeze the, the ice cube basically inside of the balloon into a round circle, which is really fun. It's fun with if you have kids too. It's kind of a fun little activity for doing those different things. Um, what are some questions that, does anybody have any questions? Or I don't know, Deb, can you see if anyone has any questions? On One that? person had a, just said, no, not a question, just comment. Okay. okay, I like it. I'll, I'll tell you, Inga was uh, down at WPP at a fundraiser and Christopher Kimball, mm -hmm. the guy from- Yeah, Milk Street, now uh, uh, yeah. Cook's Kitchen. Yeah. Cook's Kitchen. And somebody in the audience said, well, how many people do you have helping you cook? You know, doing your recipes, and he said, "Oh, 126." And Inga goes, "Oh, I have two. <laughs> so the rest, but are they're really amazing people." <laughs> that <I have. laughs> yeah, that's you know a lot of uh, what I do on the farm. My husband works off the farm, uh, so I really have to rely on my wonderful parents to be helping me at the farm. In Wisconsin, you need a cheesemaker's license to be able to make cheese. Uh, my dad was able to go get his cheesemaker's license a few years ago. Uh, and even though I started making cheese in my 20s, uh, I was making cheese in other states. So I don't have my Wisconsin license. So right now I'm apprenticing with him in our creamery. And I was thinking this morning how lucky I am to have my parents being, you know, uh, the, the pay is not great when you come work on my farm, but, but I get really good hugs, I feel like. <laughs> so, you know, my, my parents are out there all the time helping me on the farm. I have a retired neighbor that comes down and and helps out with a few different things around the place. And it's really, you know, that's when you say like a family farm, it really is a, a family farm. My mom has to, had to learn how to wrap our cheese. So after we take our cheese out of the press, we uh, basically just slather it in melted butter and then put a cheesecloth on top, slather that in butter, put another cheesecloth on top. Right. How many women are out there in the audience today? Well, we, Inga and I knew it. Rick couldn't put the cheesecloths on. Oh. Inga and I knew how. Because it's, it's like putting Spanx on when you just have to, you have to hold up so tight around the cheese. <laughs> or pantyhose. <laughs> What's the time? Uh, 10.30. Oh, 10 well, minutes. Is there any other questions for us today? You can find episodes of our show at wpt.org or PBS Wisconsin. Uh, if you do a Google search there, you can find us on social media at Around the Farm Table. Uh, you can listen to some podcasts that we have on your podcast app if you search Around the Farm Table. We'd love to have some of you get a hold of us to do, be able to interview you for an upcoming podcast about maple syrup. Um, let's see. Yeah, you can. Uh, and I, yeah, how does it taste? The sweet and the salty are, and they're not fighting each other. You can taste the cheese, the sweet of the syrup, the bacon. Oh, it's a knockout. Well, I hope you'll gather with us next time around the farm table. I'm your host, Inga Witcher. And I'm the mom, Cynthia. <laughs> Thank you very much, Inga. That was wonderful.